Chapter 3 The Fullness of the Time When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. The Savior's coming was foretold in Eden. When Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfillment. They joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping that he might be the deliverer. But the fulfillment of the promise tarried. Those who first received it died without the sight. From the days of Enoch, the promise was repeated through patriarchs and prophets, keeping alive the hope of his appearing, and yet he came not. The prophecy of Daniel revealed the time of his advent, but not all rightly interpreted the message. Century after century passed away. The voices of the prophet ceased. The hand of the oppressor was heavy upon Israel, and many were ready to exclaim, The days are prolonged, and every vision faileth. But like the stars in the vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purposes know no haste and no delay. Through the symbols of the great darkness and the smoking furnace, God had revealed to Abraham the bondage of Israel in Egypt, and had declared that the time of their sojourning should be four hundred years. Afterward, he said, shall they come out with great substance. Against that word, all the power of Pharaoh's proud empire battled in vain. On the selfsame day, appointed in the divine promise, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So in heaven's council the hour for the coming of Christ had been determined. When the great clock of time pointed to that hour, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son. Providence had directed the movements of nations and the tide of human impulse and influence until the world was ripe for the coming of the Deliverer. The nations were united under one government. One language was widely spoken and was everywhere recognized as the language of literature. From all lands the Jews of the dispersion gathered to Jerusalem to the annual feasts. As these returned to the places of their sojourn, they could spread throughout the world the tidings of the Messiah's coming. At this time the systems of heathenism were losing their hold upon the people. Many were weary of pageant and fable. They longed for a religion that could satisfy the heart. While the light of truth seemed to have departed from among men, there were souls who were looking for light and who were filled with perplexity and sorrow. They were thirsting for a knowledge of the living God, for some assurance of a life beyond the grave. As the Jews had departed from God, faith had grown dim and hope had well nigh ceased to illuminate the future. The words of the prophets were uncomprehended. To the masses of the people, death was a dread mystery. Beyond was uncertainty and gloom. It was not alone the wailing of the mothers of Bethlehem, but the cry from the great heart of humanity that was born to the prophet across the centuries, the voice heard in Ramah, lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. In the region and shadow of death, men sat unsolaced. With longing eyes they looked for the coming of the Deliverer, when the darkness should be dispelled and the mystery of the future should be made plain. Outside of the Jewish nation, there were men who foretold the appearance of a divine instructor. These men were seeking for truth, and to them the spirit of inspiration was imparted. One after another, like stars in the darkened heavens, such teachers had arisen. Their words of prophecy had kindled hope in the hearts of thousands of the Gentile world. For hundreds of years the scriptures had been translated into the Greek language, then widely spoken throughout the Roman Empire. The Jews were scattered everywhere, and their expectation of the Messiah's coming was to some extent shared by the Gentiles. Among those whom the Jews styled heathen were men who had a better understanding of the scripture prophecies concerning the Messiah 
than had the teachers in Israel. There were some who hoped for his coming as a deliverer from sin. Philosophers endeavored to study into the mystery of the Hebrew economy, but the bigotry of the Jews hindered the spread of the light. Intent on maintaining the separation between themselves and other nations, they were unwilling to impart the knowledge they still possessed concerning the symbolic service. The true interpreter must come. The one whom all these types prefigured must explain their significance. Through nature, through types and symbols, through patriarchs and prophets, God had spoken to the world. Lessons must be given to humanity in the language of humanity. The messenger of the covenant must speak. His voice must be heard in his own temple. Christ must come to utter words which should be clearly and definitely understood. He, the author of truth, must separate truth from the chaff of man's utterance, which had made it of no effect. The principles of God's government and the plan of redemption must be clearly defined. The lessons of the Old Testament must be fully set before men. Among the Jews there were yet steadfast souls, descendants of that holy line through whom a knowledge of God had been preserved. These still looked for the hope of the promise made unto the fathers. They strengthened their faith by dwelling upon the assurance given through Moses, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Again they read how the Lord would anoint one to preach good tidings unto the meek, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. They read how he would set judgment in the earth, how the isles should wait for his law, how the Gentiles should come to his light and kings to the brightness of his rising. The dying words of Jacob filled them with hope. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. The waning power of Israel testified that the Messiah's coming was at hand. The prophecy of Daniel pictured the glory of his reign over an empire which should succeed all earthly kingdoms, and said the prophet, It shall stand forever. While few understood the nature of Christ's mission, There was a widespread expectation of a mighty prince who should establish his kingdom in Israel and who should come as a deliverer to the nations. The fullness of the time had come. Humanity becoming more degraded through ages of transgression called for the coming of the Redeemer. Satan had been working to make the gulf deep and impassable between earth and heaven. By his falsehoods, he had emboldened men in sin. It was his purpose to wear out the forbearance of God and to extinguish his love for man so that he would abandon the world to satanic jurisdiction. Satan was seeking to shut out from men a knowledge of God, to turn their attention from the temple of God and to establish his own kingdom. His strife for supremacy had seemed to be almost wholly successful. It was true that in every generation God had his agencies. Even among the heathen, there were men through whom Christ was working to uplift the people from their sin and degradation. But these men were despised and hated. Many of them suffered a violent death. The dark shadow that Satan had cast over the world grew deeper and deeper. Through heathenism, Satan had for ages turned men away from God but he won his great triumph in perverting the faith of Israel. By contemplating and worshiping their own conceptions, the heathen had lost a knowledge of God and had become more and more corrupt. And so it was with Israel. The principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. It had now become the principle of the Jewish religion. Satan had implanted this principle Wherever it was held, men have no barrier against sin. 
The message of salvation is communicated to men through human agencies. But the Jews had sought to make a monopoly of the truth, which is eternal life. They had hoarded the living manna, and it had turned to corruption. The religion which they tried to shut up to themselves became an offense. They robbed God of His glory and defrauded the world by a counterfeit of the gospel. They had refused to surrender themselves to God for the salvation of the world, and they became agents of Satan for its destruction. The people whom God had called to be the pillar and ground of the truth had become representatives of Satan. They were doing the work that he desired them to do, taking a course to misrepresent the character of God and cause the world to look upon him as a tyrant. The very priests who ministered in the temple had lost sight of the significance of the service they performed. They had ceased to look beyond the symbol to the thing signified. In presenting the sacrificial offerings, they were as actors in a play. The ordinances which God himself had appointed were made the means of blinding the mind and hardening the heart. God could do no more for man through these channels. The whole system must be swept away. The deception of sin had reached its height. All the agencies for depraving the souls of men had been put in operation. The Son of God, looking upon the world, beheld suffering and misery. With pity he saw how men had become victims of satanic cruelty. He looked with compassion upon those who were being corrupted, murdered, and lost. They had chosen a ruler who chained them to his car as captives. Bewildered and deceived, they were moving on in gloomy procession toward eternal ruin, to death in which is no hope of life, toward night to which comes no morning. Satanic agencies were incorporated with men. The bodies of human beings made for the dwelling place of God had become the habitation of demons. The senses, the nerves, the passions, the organs of men were worked by supernatural agencies in the indulgence of the vilest lust. The very stamp of demons was impressed upon the countenances of men. Human faces reflected the expression of the legions of evil with which they were possessed. Such was the prospect upon which the world's Redeemer looked. What a spectacle for infinite purity to behold! Sin had become a science, and vice was consecrated as a part of religion. Rebellion had struck its roots deep into the heart, and the hostility of man was most violent against heaven. It was demonstrated before the universe that, apart from God, humanity could not be uplifted. A new element of life and power must be imparted by Him who made the world. With intense interest, the unfallen worlds had watched to see Jehovah arise and sweep away the inhabitants of the earth. And if God should do this, Satan was ready to carry out his plan for securing to himself the allegiance of heavenly beings. He had declared that the principles of God's government make forgiveness impossible. Had the world been destroyed, he would have claimed that his accusations were proved true. He was ready to cast blame upon God and to spread his rebellion to the worlds above. But instead of destroying the world... God sent His Son to save it. Though corruption and defiance might be seen in every part of the alien province, a way for its recovery was provided. At the very crisis, when Satan seemed about to triumph, the Son of God came with the embassage of divine grace. Through every age, through every hour, the love of God had been exercised toward the fallen race. Notwithstanding the perversity of men, the signals of mercy had been continually exhibited. And when the fullness of the time had come, the Deity was glorified by pouring upon the world a flood of healing grace that was never to be obstructed or withdrawn till the plan of salvation should be fulfilled. Satan was exulting that he had succeeded in debasing the image of God in humanity. Then Jesus came, 
to restore in man the image of his Maker. None but Christ can fashion anew the character that has been ruined by sin. He came to expel the demons that had controlled the will. He came to lift us up from the dust, to reshape the marred character after the pattern of his divine character, and to make it beautiful with his own glory.